A few years back, I posted an experience from my youth on this subreddit. When I originally recounted it here, I was handling some personal issues and I believe it was reflected in my writing. The night I spoke about has distinguished itself in memory with such vivid detail compared to how it was previously conveyed that I've always felt as if I didn't quite do it justice, though mind you, I am a harsher critic of myself than I ought to be. To capture it for posterity's sake with an added splash of polish and local flavor, I began rewriting it last week in a clearer authorial voice. You can find a link to the original recollection at the bottom of the post. I also decided to retitle it, The Birthday Mob, as it doesn't arouse the notion that I was pursued by a band of animatronic creatures at a themed children's restaurant, at least, not quite as much. Once more, I hope that you all enjoy it, asterisk asterisk asterisk. I've had a couple of frightening occurrences throughout my life, but none that have ever rivaled the distressing nature of one particular night during my senior year of high school. I had been coping through the latest in a series of breakups with my girlfriend and was searching for any reason I could find to leave my angst dungeon of a home office where I already spent countless hours dwelling on the end of the relationship. My friend, Mia, resided in a neighboring subdivision and had invited me down to hang out with herself and her brother. Since I had only been acquainted with Mia for a short while, my social anxiety urged me to forward the invitation along to another friend and frequent companion of mine, Robert. Mia had no trouble with this and Robert seldom if ever required advanced notice for casual misadventures, allowing for his presence to be a guarantee well before asking him. Mia had conditions of her own, insisting that I call her to meet us as soon as we arrived at the transit station in her area. I had been to Mia's house once on an evening not long before where I shared in a politely tense dinner interrogation with her folks and it was a fairly straightforward route from where the bus would let us off. The gesture never registered as anything more than a courtesy and so I agreed unquestioningly just feeling fortunate for the company. Robert had amassed a small cache of fireworks that he had been looking to set off at an appropriate time. Since that time never arose, I let him know that tonight was the night as I waited on him at the back porch by his bedroom. He muttered at protest then immediately relented and snatched indiscriminately from the stockpile underneath his bed. In twenty minutes, a city bus took us through familiar haunts, eventually crossing over the bus trap that existed as an informal boundary between two communities on the northwest side of town. It was a tightly constructed underpass accessible only to public transit and compact commercial trucks with a walkway protected by concrete dividers for bikes and pedestrian foot traffic. The central feature and origin of its name is a square pit with a loose arrangement of steel bars meant to ensnare intruding vehicles that didn't meet the specified requirements to enter. This was before the dawn of the sports utility vehicle would render them obsolete and an automated gate was installed to continue justifying its function. Now a bit of an anomaly in its current environment, it still served its purpose and was akin to an unguarded border checkpoint. I hadn't anticipated going out that night so when we made it to the station close to eleven, I was consciously conserving my limited cell life to let Mia know of our arrival. The low battery icon flashes after the call, an indication that there was plenty left over to punish myself with the prospect of a reconciliatory message from my ex that would appear through the virtue of wishful thinking. As Robert and I warbled through a catalogue of 80s tunes at vacillating pitches a beat behind tempo, a black SUV with tinted windows blew past us in the parking area next to the station. Its tires whirred banshee-like against the asphalt as it weaved erratically, the unseen driver beating out a rallying cry on the horn before tearing off toward the same inner ring suburb that we were destined for ourselves. Mia and her brother arrived not long after and we set our sights on a nearby schoolyard to cause a racket with some consumer-grade fireworks. In a fleeting spectacle, the twin Roman candles and the majority of the bottle rockets had been expended with all but the few duds in the array fulfilling their advertised purpose of attracting attention. Another roving SUV came streaking down the road closest to the schoolyard within minutes. A collection of balloons tethered to the interior of the vehicle through a gap in the rear window battled the wind's thrust before the vehicle came to a jarring halt. Mia abruptly directed us to wait where we were and jogged off in the direction of the idling SUV. We witnessed a figure hop out of the passenger seat to approach her. Though they were out of earshot, 
I felt a deep ease of relief as she received the greeting with warmth. There was a rapport and friendliness not commonly associated with the foreboding strangers that you meet after dark. Mia was the type of person that you couldn't help but like. She was bright, amiable, talented, and never did much to offend anyone. She treated everyone on equal terms and her resulting popularity eclipsed the alleged social strata of senior high. I, on the other hand, was far more familiar with certain classroom archetypes than I ever would have liked to have been, the choches, the bullies, the bad seeds, many of whom converged on a fixed point of our hometown's map, the apparent center of which was her former district school. In spite of its academic reputation, its student body had attained some degree of notoriety for its high rate of juvenile offenders. I was reasonably confident at this age that the flaring tempers between the respective cliques would simmer off after graduation, but there would always be those select few that would make illicit behavior and more premeditated acts of physical violence a lifestyle choice. I was, and still am to this day a tiny man at thirty years old, never rising above five feet four inches and what you might conceive of as an easy target. The reputation I held in my own halls was one of a mischievous but good-natured slacker who could take a punch but couldn't throw one, and I relied on the more beneficial trait to compensate for my deficit of muscle mass when diffusing tense situations with somebody outside of my chosen circle of oddballs. It didn't have a foolproof rate of success, but it allowed me to skate relatively unscathed for most of my scholastic career. Mia and the stranger exchanged a quick embrace before their parting waves. I watched the SUV as it pulled a hasty U-turn, careening past a stop sign off to startle unwary pedestrians with its engine elsewhere away from us. Unprompted but desired nonetheless, we were provided with some critical context that was about to color the remainder of the night as soon as she reconvened with our group. That was a friend of mine from St. Francis. They're out celebrating his buddy's 18th birthday by driving around and beating the shit out of people walking by themselves. You're fine with me here, but I think we should probably head inside now. In the moments that followed, I took notice of how the lights emanating from the surrounding homes in the area had grown increasingly scarce, the parceled rations of security that they represented winking out of existence along with them. Fine by me, then. I'd rather not be elected the guest sacrifice in some kid's twisted adulthood initiation rites as he proves his machismo to his buddies while they trade turns packing my face in. When we got to Mia's house shortly thereafter without any incident, the mood had grown contemplatively quiet as we settled in having had a light-hearted evening of adolescent memory-making spoiled by douchebags. Everyone was worn out, so we agreed to toss on a film, some inoffensive mid-aughts comedy that I can't recall the name of. Not even twenty minutes had passed in the runtime before Mia's father appeared at the living room threshold. Mia, it's getting late. Say good night to your friends. There's been a lot of speculation whenever I've recounted this story over who was primarily at fault for the avoidable events that transpired afterward. Though I've heard accusations that I've been overly forgiving, I remain of the mind that everyone was honestly intended. Mia had spoken in our favor citing the potentially dangerous circumstances that awaited us outside, her father met these claims with a liberal dose of parental skepticism while Robert and I advocated for our own well-being by sitting in abject silence as the scene unfolded. Despite the mild to moderate unrest from earlier, the sedating calm of lounging indoors on a sofa had a minimizing effect on the risks involved. I mean, taking into consideration how many dozens of streets this community comprised, if we moved quickly and took precautions, what was the likelihood that these goons would ever catch a second glimpse of us? We dismissed it all as an exaggeration. She had made her best effort to explain our situation and dissuade her father from booting us to the curb, but as an honor student with devoutly invested parents, the rules of the household are inviolable. Bed by twelve and no sanctuary for teenage boys overnight. There was no argument to convince him otherwise. As we were standing on Mia's front porch, she belatedly informed us that there were not one or two, but a total of four SUVs out on the prowl. After offering us her profuse apologies and well wishes, we reassured her that we'd be fine. She then latched the door behind us so we could set to recalculating our odds. 
my cellular battery had long since been drained having waited for that text like the lovelorn sap that I was. Robert, on the other hand, had never even bothered to carry a cell phone with him as he communicated with everyone he knew almost exclusively over MSN Messenger. Ill prepared for the occasion, it looked as if we were resigned to traveling by foot. We paced about cul-de-sac considering which routes would keep us from straying onto the main streets and arterial roads. The most sensible was also the longest with the bus trap being a clean getaway from the birthday boy and his pals. We were fortunate to have gone to school in the area and knew of the many tucked away corridors and shortcuts where ample tree canopies would be able to conceal us in shadow. We could stay virtually hidden for 80% of the journey if we used our wits. It's worth reiterating here again that we were remedial teenagers for whom flexing poor judgment skills was a respected tradition. We were also aware that the transit station would be shuttering relatively soon. While the train wouldn't be of any use to us since this particular station was the final terminal on the line, there was just a sliver of a chance that the buses might still be active. It was only a short walk back the way we came through a park overlooking the entrance. From there on we'd be completely exposed with nothing but looking storefronts and a large, barren parking lot illuminated by what might as well have been the halogen floodlights that they shine on escaped prisoners as they rush across the yard towards freedom. We chose to hazard our bets since it was practically on our way to the bus trap, anyhow. Taking inventory of what could prove useful to us, I wasn't at all surprised to find my pockets empty, save for a wallet and the dead cell phone. Robert held a Zippo lighter in his possession as well as a single remaining bottle rocket. Needled by a desire to feel resourceful, I scanned our surroundings before spotting a remodeled home with an industrial disposal bin out on the front street. I kept inside and re-emerged with a wooden plank fanged with crooked finishing nails that I hefted in my hand like buffered pusser reborn. This failed to impose any profound dread but I did win a derisive laugh from Robert. He gestured to me with his bottle rocket, expressing his desire to fire it into someone's face should they try and come near us. Now heavily armed and in much higher spirits, we skulked along the interposing footpaths between neighborhoods, which in hindsight, did little to help us steady our nerves. Our courage, however, faltered at an intersection where a lone, dusky street lamp stood sentinel by a vestibule of low-slung branches so compact it was as if someone draped a shroud across the moon. Lifelong urbanites get to relish in the light pollution that paints our skyline, mistaken in the belief that even proper darkness has a translucent quality. And then, here was this one stretch of pavement so innocuous by day, restyled after sunset as a disorienting tunnel with the stark density of exhaust fumes. We crept in a maximum of 25 to 30 feet ahead before paralysis struck, the night's deserted ambience punctuated by the remote echoes of shouting, squealing tires, and the sudden acceleration of a vehicle. Only able to locate each other by our voices suspended in limbo, we agonized in whispers as to how we should proceed. Do we find an alternate detour or stick it out, listening for any further suggestion of movement on the other side of the emptiness? Beset with paranoia, the eerie silence it returned was a potent incentive to turn around. We briefly contemplated camping out for the remainder of the night before opting to double back. We subsequently found our way through the park exit to the main thoroughfare. There was little in the way of traffic at night, so if one of the SUVs were to materialize we would see them plainly, and they would see us. We strained our hearing for any trace of obnoxious motor revving before bolting across the road and past the parking lot to the transit bays. We hurriedly checked the posted bus times but each had made their final loop ages ago, the station clock revealing what our hesitation had cost us. Diminished in resolve, we aimed to take shelter in the train terminal which was typically left unlocked after hours. If we were to be granted any small mercies, the universe wasn't ready to let us cash in yet and the locked station doors rattled in their frames as they refused to budge. Our choice determined for us, we moved on to the bus trap. Every distant noise provided a reason to flinch, never certain if it was a thrill-seeking motorist out for a joyride or the assailants that were preoccupying our thoughts. There was a strong possibility that someone had called the police on them or that they had driven off to avoid detection. In a cosmically just world, 
they'd have already been under arrest without their fatefully appointed rendezvous with a sorry individual who had the audacity to pick that night of all nights to take in the early autumn breeze. Maybe they had even grown bored with their party plans altogether. We started to let our guard slip as we neared our old junior high school, believing that the worst-case scenario we were on the alert for was already behind us and I was still lofting around a cumbersome piece of wood like a full-fledged jackass. It was a welcome low, but the effects of fatigue began to wear on me as the initial surge of adrenaline tapered off. Another network of loosely interconnected passages awaited us at the far end of the school, backyard fences exhibiting the scribbled handiwork of amateur graffiti artists beckoned our entry. Our off-property lunch breaks had taken us that way years beforehand so we knew for a fact it had intermittent street lamps every 60 feet or so, whether they were even operational was a different matter. As it turned out, this was a low-priority matter for the community. To my knowledge, they still haven't been replaced a decade later. Motion-sensitive porch lights would flood our field of view at blinding intervals, Robert all the while sparking his Zippo out of fitful habit to disclose his growing impatience with our inching progress. Twigs snapping beneath the paws of nocturnal animals out on a midnight forage aroused silhouetted figures from my overworked imagination, ones that reached out with invisible hands to seize their quarry and pummel us bloody. Finally, a steady source of light appeared ahead and we came out onto the street with that holiest of landmarks now within sprinting distance, though neither of us was feeling so athletically inclined. Cutting through an elementary school, our humor gradually returned to us having turned a leisurely stroll into some clumsy trial of stealth. Compared to the winding trip we had taken to get here, full of retraced steps, dead-end deviations, and hesitant plodding through neglected footpaths, this last leg had been lit up like a runway welcoming us home. We slid back into our ordinary banter with safety on the horizon while I openly considered how long I would hold on to my improvised bludgeon before I discarded it in some baffling manner that a homeowner would try in vain to puzzle together at sunrise. As I took listless swings with the plank in my forward gate, a black SUV came peeling out from around the corner on the left-hand side of the bus trap, the balloons hanging from the rear window flailed backward from the velocity as the engine roared. Had they been waiting there for somebody this entire fucking time? It didn't really matter at this stage. There's no way they hadn't seen us. I cursed repeatedly as we dashed half a block in retreat, turning off onto the street adjacent to the elementary school. We both had to think fast as their rapid advance only left us with a rough 15-second lead even at the posted speed limit and they had no intention of giving us any advantages. The front yards melded together lacking any distinction between property lines, leaving us nowhere to crouch and hide. We could hear the vehicle gaining ground on us, nearing the bend. Our head start had all but evaporated and I raised a panicked finger toward the only space that could pass for cover, a partial strip of flimsy side yard fencing. No accompanying front fence, no perimeter hedges, nothing. Ashamedly, I entertained the impulse of launching myself over the fence knowing full well it would leave Robert behind. Thinking better of it, I sprawled myself onto the grass hugging close to the fence with Robert following suit, long like boards and stiff as corpses, our respective implements at the ready looking all the more laughably desperate than ever before. A loose copse of birch, a willow, and a massive pine tree was all that could shield us from an imminent beating now. The SUV lost speed as it made the turn, the headlights shine intensifying as they drew nearer. We may have unwittingly bought ourselves the element of surprise without a clue as to how we'd properly exploit it. Robert uncapped the Zippo and nestled it close to the fuse, his thumb on the flint wheel. I attempted to press myself further into the ground but the hard earth wouldn't give way. They came to a full stop and parked at the edge of the property. Right. Fucking. Next to us. The sleek chrome grill peered out from beyond the fence line. The doors popped open, gravel crunching as the birthday mob murmured indiscernibly and began pacing as they searched for us. I tried to gather a sense of the disparity in numbers by tracking their footfalls. My ear wasn't up to the task, but it was enough to know that the ratio was firmly set against us and we'd be surrounded if we decided to flee. I had seldom if ever swung a fist at anyone, always too busy with the illusion of composure to defend myself at the risk of looking foolish for it. 
At least then, being on a first-name basis with my rogues gallery of aloof tormentors was humanizing enough that a scuffle wouldn't escalate to injure anything but my pride. These people were strangers. They weren't aware of the bullshit persona that I affected, my ragdoll antics where I would swallow pain with a wry smirk. They didn't know I pretended to treat it as a game. All they wanted was to hurt us. So, this was it. This was where I'd be forced to shed the layers of protective cowardice and earn my own fucking respect. I gripped the plank tightly, tiny splinters burrowed into my palm as I caught the sound of my thrumming heart rate. This helped summon 125 pounds of buried aggression from years worth of play-acting my way through confrontation to outmatch the fear of a losing fight. My free hand fumbled on the nails as I pried them upright. I prayed that Robert's firework would generate a sufficient amount of confusion so that I would get in a few good cracks during the ambush before they'd have us back on the ground and ready for our ambulance ride. Even if I was only going to get in one strike, I was going to make sure it connected. But then, everything fell into a drawn-out stillness with only the galvanic hum of the nearest street lamp to add its supporting harmony. An uncharacteristic peace overtook my focused reveries of meeting out a solitary blow of disfiguring bloodshed when I heard a frustrated voice lowly utter the phrase, fuck it. Slamming doors followed in the wake of this statement. The SUV sprung to life, the wheels skidding as they pulled out and sped off. Just like that, they were gone. The rigor of our bodies softened as we collapsed in place, not yet ready to sit up for fear that this might be a tactic. The longer we stayed, the clearer it became that we had been given the deus ex machina we spent the night waiting for. When we had regained our bearings and were ready to push ourselves up, we drifted along the side streets in relative quiet. We never wandered away from the center of the road. I haven't come up with a satisfying explanation as to what kept us from skulking the remainder of the way back to the bus trap, it just didn't seem necessary any longer. I suppose you can chalk it up to a symptom of trauma's insulating afterglow, though if you were to ask us then, we wouldn't have been able to process the shock and admit such a thing. It would live on as another treasured anecdote until the day that we could afford psychologists to tell us otherwise. We had almost forgotten to acknowledge the fact that we made it. From within our collective fugue, we glanced back down the road looking for some significance to the whole ordeal because it felt like the type of thing a person ought to do, but if there was any poignant denouement waiting for us at the end, it wasn't readily apparent from the other side of the underpass. If I had to shoehorn in a takeaway, it's that despite my aversion to conflict and the many previous assumptions about my yellow instincts, if miserable happenstance finds me backed into the corner again, I might just be able to stand my ground. I just sure as hell hope that there's some discarded timber nearby when that time comes. This happened about a year ago. I was on Grindr looking for either fun dates or new friendships, for those of you unfamiliar with Grindr, it's a social media app that is designed primarily for gay men, and many people use it to hook up with other men. One day, I was scrolling, and I received a new message from a guy who will call Brian. I took a look at some of his profile pictures, read his bio, and decided that I was interested in him. We started messages back and forth, and he seemed to be a really kind, charismatic guy who really knew how to hold a conversation, something that is very hard to come by on the app. A few days went by, and we eventually exchanged numbers. He seemed nice enough, and I wanted to see if he was as great in person as he was over text message. So I asked him if he wanted to go on a date with me. He very happily agreed. So, I scheduled a date with him. The plan was that I was going to drive to his place, pick him up, and we'd grab some lattes at my favorite local coffee shop. It was around 6 p.m. and I sent him a text message to tell him that I was leaving my house, to which he responded with a quaint, I can't wait to meet you. I smiled at his supposed kindness. Then, in the middle of driving to his house, I received a phone call from him, so I picked up, and the conversation went, mostly, as follows. Me, hey Brian, what's up? Brian, hey, quick change of plans. I'm feeling tired and I would rather not go out. Would you be okay with staying at my place? We can watch some shows and order some takeout. Me, 
I mean, that's not what I really had in mind. I like to go out and do things on the first date. Brian, oh don't be such a buzzkill. Just come over. I won't show you a bad time. As he spoke on the phone, I got a really strange feeling in my gut. Like something was wrong about how he talked to me. Before I met him, I imagined his voice and inflections to sound a lot more lighthearted because the way we texted was very whimsical and fun. But over the phone, he talked as if he was in a hurry. Perhaps slightly frantic. However, despite my gut feeling, I decided that I would accept his offer. Maybe he was just tired or stressed from the workday. I pulled into his driveway, and he greeted me at his door. He looked like his picture, and he was very handsome. He was wearing fashionable glasses, and his dark, straight hair contrasted with his light skin. When we went inside I was greeted by one of his roommates who was playing Dark Souls in the living room. I wanted to be polite, so I approached the roommate and introduced myself. I didn't want to come off as rude to Brian in case this date ended up going really well. While I'm talking with his roommate, Brian calls my name and beckons me to walk inside his bedroom. I politely excuse myself and follow Brian into his room. When I walked inside, I saw something straight out of a fucking r slash nasleep story, only this was real and right in front of me. There were candles lit all around, and when I got a closer look, I noticed that there were several altars scattered across the room. Effigies of ancient looking figures. Animal bones. Jars with unidentifiable liquids inside. Some sort of dagger next to a cat's skull. The whole shebang. I don't remember all the altars, but I do remember a couple. One of them was on the floor, and there was a glass container that held some kind of yellow liquid with animal skulls surrounding the container. Another altar was on a shelf next to his bed, and this one had a few candles surrounding some kind of doll with its eyes sewn shut and its hands missing. Now that one was creepy and super bizarre. A part of me was telling me to nope the fuck out of there immediately, but I thought that maybe I was overreacting to someone's religious choices. I didn't know much about cult religions, so I didn't want to assume that this guy had any kind of malice. Plus, I can be a little reactive at times, so I decided to stay and go along with the ride. When we walked into his room, I wanted to calm my nerves, and because I have a really curious mind, I decided to ask Brian about what these altars were for. He told me that he'd tell me about them later. A weird response, but again, I brushed it off my shoulders thinking that he might just be a bit eccentric. I can be a little weird too, so I tried to be empathetic and understanding. Then, I point to one of the altars and ask about it. He frowns at me and scowls. Don't touch that. His voice startled me. His intense inflections paired with his angry expression sent a lump straight to my throat, and I felt threatened. I was almost four feet away from the altar, not even close to touching it, and yet he just yelled at me like a father yelling at his kid to stop messing around at church. I was confused, and thinking I had done something wrong, I apologized. In the blink of an eye, his scowl turned into a smile, and he kindly invited me to sit with him to watch a show. What really weirded me out was the fact that his smile looked and felt genuine. He had just gotten angry, but all of a sudden, he didn't care and served me up a really kind disposition. I was unsure of how to process what had just happened, so I just decided to sit down with him. He seemed to be acting pretty normal once this ordeal had happened, and we started to talk about ourselves. After some time, he became really sweet and soft-spoken, similar to how he was over text message, and we were able to share some stories about our lives. It was starting to feel like an actual first date, and my nerves subsided a bit. I was probably just overthinking everything else. He then turns on his TV. Now, mind you, I was still a little freaked out by his random outburst, so I was on guard. So, I offered to invite his roommate to come and hang out with us. Brian's roommate seemed like any old average Joe when I met him, and I just wanted someone else to be there to act as a buffer. I wanted to see how he would act around other people, but when I gave him my idea, he immediately shut me down, and his personality switched from easygoing distressed and angry. 
he started cussing out his roommate to me, making it clear that he absolutely hated him. The switch was so jarring, I started to panic again. Then, he changed the subject and started to talk about me. He said that he found me really attractive, and in the process, his fingers started to graze my thighs. I needed a second to collect myself, though, so I excused myself to get some water. When I stood up, he immediately slapped my ass and told me not to take too long. I walked out, closed the door behind me, and started to make my way to the kitchen. I was hoping to chat with his roommate on the way and see if I could ask him about Brian. But he was asleep on the living room couch, so I just made a beeline to the cabinets in search of a cup. I thought about walking out and driving home because I didn't appreciate his sudden touchiness, but I started getting paranoid. He had all those altars, and he didn't tell me what the altars were for. I've seen some horror films about the occult, and I truly had no idea what this guy was capable of. Yeah, he was sweet at times, but he was showing me some really aggressive behavior. Who's to say that this guy isn't able to put some kind of voodoo curse on me? Dramatic, I know, but you can never really be sure. So, I grab my water and cautiously head back to his room. When I walked back inside, I saw him sitting on the couch with his legs crossed and his eyes closed. When I approached him, I saw his mouth moving, but I didn't hear anything coming from it. Weirded out by this, I called his name, but he didn't respond. Strange. I called his name a second time, and he opened his eyes, uncrossed his legs, and went back to watching the TV without at all addressing what he was doing. What? The. Fuck. I was getting really worried, but I did what I could to keep my cool. I didn't want to do anything to upset him or make him lose his cool. I sat next to him on the couch, and we start talking. Once again, he was completely normal. Unervingly normal. It's like I was in the room with a real-life Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde except Brian was able to switch between them seamlessly. I needed to do something. But what the fuck was I supposed to do? I couldn't call him out because he might lash out in some malicious way. But I also didn't want to stay because he was freaking me the hell out. I just stay, and I tried to devise some kind of plan to get out of there without making him angry. At some point, he gets up to grab his phone, and I thought I would try dishing out the same kind of ass grab that he gave to me when I went to get water. Maybe it would release the tension that I was feeling. Maybe he'd like it and it'd make him less aggressive. Regardless, I wanted to try something. I made my move and gave him a cheeky ass grab. Immediately, he turned around, swatted my hand away, and lunged at me. He had his hand curled up in a fist, and he flung it towards my face. His fist was inches away from making a connection with my right cheek, but he stopped mid-punch. At that moment, I saw that his eyes were wide open, and his facial expression was cold and emotionless. He was right in my face. My heart was beating so fast that I felt like I was seconds away from an aneurysm. He was looking directly at me, and my eyes stared back. At that moment, I felt like the prey to his predator. Then, he uncurled his fist, put his icy hands on both sides of my face and started to squeeze. You're just so cute. He pulled me in and forced a kiss. I absolutely did not want to kiss him, but I was paralyzed and couldn't push him away. His words were patronizing, sort of like he was talking to a dog, and it felt even more like this because he had just scrunched my face against his. I felt disgusting kissing someone who had almost punched me in the face, but there was nothing I could do at that moment. Again, I didn't want to risk pissing him off. He slowly pulled away, gave me another sweet smile, and sat down, pretending that nothing had just happened. Just started staring at the TV. Yep, I'm over this, completely. His behavior was becoming more erratic and more unpredictable, his room was fucking creepy as shit, he clearly had associations with the occult, and frankly, he was scaring me. I eventually decided that I'd rather deal with the voodoo-looking altars later on than stay in his house and have to put up with the immediate danger. So, I snapped myself out of my anxiety-induced trance, stood up, 
and told him that I was starting to get sick and that I wanted to go home. He got angry and tried to convince me to stay the night, but I gathered my courage and insisted that it was time for me to leave. He begrudgingly let me, but it was clear that my decision pissed him off. I didn't care anymore. I said my goodbyes and told him that I'd text him later, thinking, fuck that, to myself while doing so. I got in my car and drove home shaking and sweating. I felt relieved to get out of there but nervous that he might try to do something. The uncertainty of it all is what truly shakes me up, but thankfully, no actual harm came to me. Who knows what would have happened if I had stayed, though. I blocked Brian's number as well as his grinder profile, and even now, I keep my own grinder pictures private. I haven't heard from him since, but I still fear that he's going to try and come after me somehow. To Brian the Erratic Occultist, let's never meet again.